Okay. Uh, oh, uh, from the wonderful <laughs> presentation by Stefano, you can understand that I'm a very old person and uh, I'm going to retire uh, next November. Uh, I'll, although I go on teaching in the Polytechnica in the School of Architecture at least this year, maybe for some years. Uh, when I was asked uh, to to deliver this lecture, I I was thinking, well, what's a good cycle? A new challenges on the water cycle. This is a official one, but uh, my talk is water for future, uh, and uh, my message uh, it is in two sentences uh, that you can see on my uh, on my screen. I hope, uh, I think uh, now you can see also my screen. And these two sentences are, what if a future that is not what it used to be, which is taken from, uh, from a sentence by a poet, a French poet, Paul Valéry, but is really, really, really uh, associated with water in the century. And the second one, I, uh, I quote uh, an aphorism by Mark Twain, uh, which is time and tide wait for no man, which is a pompous proverb in the United States. And it was true for a billion years. But in our day of electric wires and water ballast, we turn it around. Man waits not for time or tide. And this is the message that I will try to give you in this uh, uh, lecture. Now, let's uh, look at what is the challenge. The challenge in the new millennium is that the role of water has become a keystone of social systems at any geographical scale. The villagers are perfectly aware of this and must contrast the improvements and pollution sources and the hard fee by multinational companies. Countries involved in conflicts that risk escalating into real water wars. Uh, we have seen many, many recent cases of this, are currently experiencing the challenge and earth facing climate change knows very well that the water cycle is the crankshaft of climate system. One should have this very clear. One drop of water takes eight years, eight days to perform a complete cycle all around the planet. So that this fast cycle is essentially the Ma the core of the mesh of the climate machine. But look, look at this slide. Uh, this is the best representation of water because we really realize the importance, the relevance of water. It is when there is no water. What do people from the history, for long history, they look for water. And the first tentatives, the first way to do this was to by drilling wells. So that we have to understand that groundwater, it is one of our primary, in any sense, sources of fresh water. Usually technology was had a lot of improvement across the century. But just uh, 4,000 years ago, people made this type of uh, masterpiece, engineering masterpiece, which is the Canat, which is a system where from one mother wall, you can uh, divert the water from the water table to the irrigated land. And people realize this type of system, which is the Kanat system you can find in the Middle East mainly, but there are also some similar example in the ancient uh, uh, Native America, in the uh, South America. 
And you can see that in this way, the man that was a hunter, who was a nomad and come to uh, become an agricultural man, uh, used to irrigate land. So uh, this is a very complex system. It, it has been taken a lot of years to be developed, but it is really true because this is the diagram of a typical canat, and this is an aerial photo of a canat of about 3,000 years ago, which is 1,000 before Christ. And if you look at this, you can find also on the left, on the right side, this is the water distribution system. The water distribution system, which is a, a typical system where people have to share water. People have to share water. And I think, and I remember uh, a work by Pietro Laureano, which is an architect, which is an architect who found a relationship between the where, this is called technically a where, that the parts water, divert water for different uses, different user, and the geological, then, sorry, the uh, tree of uh, different genealogies of the people. So that father had three sons, the first son had two sons, and one of them had the two sons again. And so that we have this tree, which is the genealogical tree of people life. We can find many, many examples of how water can be saved and stored. Uh, my suggestion, if you haven't seen Matera, is to visit this wonderful ancient city in the south of Italy, where you can find this uh, structure of the houses, which is are hypogeic in part, are partly hypogeic, but they live on the storage of water in our quite dry region. It's a dry region. We, in this call of Palombari is the name in, uh, in uh, Italian, which are huge, huge tanks and reservoirs to save water and reuse water. And my suggestion, uh, Matera is a wonderful place for many, many other reasons, but also the use of water is a very peculiar one. As shown, for instance, by Stefan before, surely we have a most important development of water, uh, of water use uh, during the Roman age in the Western countries, because uh, we have to think also that this kind of structure were uh, built also in China, also in uh, in, uh, well, in the East, uh, in the Far East, and so on. <laughs> and these are some typical how to bring water. You have to understand that the first bridges were water bridges. If you take a, a five euros, uh, a five euros banknote you have in your pocket, and you look at the bridge that there is there. This is a bridge similar to the bridge of guard in France, which has been built for the guard aqueduct by the Romans. The Romans built also dams. The, this is the Cornalvo dams, but the Subiaco dams has been for 1,000 years, the highest dams in the world. It was 50 meters uh, in elevation. It was an elevation of 50 meters uh, and was uh, destroyed in uh, more or less in the 13th century, in 13th century after Christ uh, by a flood. Maybe they say by an earthquake and a flood. And uh, uh, is not sure at the moment, and you can understand how important was the water uh, for Romans. This is Villa Adriana in Rome, another masterpiece of ancient architecture you can visit uh, in Italy. Uh, it, these two schemes show what are the ancient uh, way of uh, 
transferring water, which is the, uh, the, the reservoir, the intake, a conduit, uh, an aqueduct bridge to the city, so that uh, in, as a, an open channel, because uh, uh, the capability of building good pipelines, uh, it is something that uh, it is only in the last uh, two, three centuries. The first good pipelines were built, uh, you cannot imagine, but were built in Calabria for the uh, aqueduct, uh, Carolina aqueduct uh, in the Royal Palace of Caserta. And uh, it, it, there are iron uh, conduits. So that now we use usually conduits for this, why in the, and so that you can understand this change it completely, but here water, it is free surface and here water flows in pressure. But let's under, try to understand what is uh, uh, the size of a problem all around the world. You can understand that earth, the earth, there is a lot of water. Uh, the Earth is the planet with the, mo <laughs> the only planet with so a large amount of water in the solar planet, in the solar system. We have 13, uh, 35 million cubic kilometers of fresh water, but it is a evenly distribution that covers the planet, or is located in areas that are expensive to tap or access. And 75 is trapped in the form of ice of snow or deep underground. Uh, you can understand from this what uh, I, I will not talk about uh, global change uh, and uh, global warming and climate change, but you can understand how much important is uh, this for the uh, availability of water. The remaining 11 million uh, cubic kilometers of readily available fresh water are under increasing stress. Human freshwater users have tripled in the last 50 years alone, so that it has become three times in 50 years. You can understand that this is, is, it is a rate of increase higher than uh, demographic increase. And the reason is that uh, also the society is developing, is doing better, and so that they need more and more water. There are roughly 7 million people, now maybe also 8 million people, 800 million people, across 45 countries living in regions with severe water scarcity. Water, I think you, everybody you know, is a unique natural resource with the capacity to become renewable. Uh, water has become consumed, it's not lost to a logical status of future use. It's simply recycled by natural system. Therefore, what do we mean for consumptive use of water? Consumptive use of water only refer to uses of water that make water availability for immediate or short-term reuse. That is water that is evaporated, transpired, incorporated into crops or consumed when we eat, as we will uh, see in, uh, in my talk. While water can eventually be recovered for future use and even the satellite, population growth, urbanization and modernization demand that policymakers to be prepared to respond to two basic issues. One is the nexus between water and food, and the second is the energy, energy security, which is a strong concern, as well as food, and so that they are linked by a unique nexus, water, food, and energy. Now try to understand a little bit what is physical water scarcity. Uh, water, we need some, some idea of the amount no, of quantitative data. So that water, we say that a country, a region, a municipality is in a condition of water stress if we have less than 1,500, 1,700 cubic meters year per capita, including all type of uses. And we will have absolute water scarcity when we have 
available less than 500 cubic meters per year per capita. And if you look at these maps, these are not very, these are quite old data because I didn't find something better. You can see that uh, this problem, the physical water scarcity, let you call, so they don't have enough water, are, there are a lot of countries that can approach uh, this problem of physical water scarcity just now. But uh, we have also a problem which is associated with economy, so that much larger is the area of the planet where there is an economic water scarcity. Try to understand uh, also what is the diversity. If we look uh, of absolute uh, freshwater availability is a weapons of mass destruction because the major issue is not only geographic distribution, but also social distribution too within a given geographic unit. And this is, uh, it is clear, for instance, in ancient uh, books and, man and handbooks uh, of uh, people working in aqueducts, if you have to, if you are uh, to supply a, a high, a high the, the, the best place in city, downtown, you need uh, 500 uh, liters per, per, per capita. If you have in poor neighborhoods, you can have also 100. But if you look at the current tendency of population to increase, this is going to amplify. So there is an amplification of diversity, not only in the economics, but also in the water availability. And this is typical. If you look, in, if you make the difference from Somalia to Singapore, you can see that you have two order of sizes, two order of sizes of water availability per capita. <laughs> if you look at a country like Italy, we are quite a, in a good shape so that we have 200. The, the water use per person is more or less so 200 liters per day, but an American is 600. But if a Chinese would like to use 600, he has no enough water in his country, and China is a large country as well the same in India or in, but also in country richer water like Nigeria is the same. So that we have also to save water. So that when talking about uh, this, uh, the first of these three uh, nexus, water and food, the second is water and energy, and then I give something about water in the city, we have to think, e that each raindrop is a kiss from heaven, which is, uh, which is a slogan, which is uh, a sentence made by uh, an architect I, I love, uh, I like a lot. Uh, I know that uh, <laughs> it is not uh, so considered uh, by Italian mainstream architecture, but uh, uh, it is uh, Friedrich Wunderwasser. And he made this, uh, this poster in uh, 1983 for a uh, first campaign, Save a Rain in Norway. Uh, so that, first of all, water is food. The water world trade has multifaceted routes, including those associated with energy, food, and any type of merchandise under a conflictual context. Water trade is now capable of bypassing local water shortages, including those producing flood scarcity, but it's not an adequate solution in the medium and long term. So that I try to show you, to uh, get you to understand this point. The major use of water resources is associated with agriculture and cattle breeding maybe 85, maybe close to 90% of water is needed to produce food. 
And uh, naturally, we have a difference uh, all around the world. And uh, you can see from these maps uh, how is the difference, hmm? the difference uh, in this sector uh, all around uh, in the uh, all around the world. But uh, we have to understand that for producing, for instance, a one pizza, no, we are in Italy. So, uh, Hopefully, I'm in Italy. I'm in, in uh, Ayas uh, in this moment. Uh, it, it, really, it, it requires more or less more than one cubic meter of water. So that 1,200 liters, 1,200 liters. If you look at a cup of coffee, it is something like uh, more than a hundred liters, and all this food. And you can understand the difference, for instance, uh, from uh, the four cubic meters for chicken and the twelve, the twelve cubic meters need for a beef steak. So that people that eat a lot of uh, car food or beef food and so on, they use an enormous amount of water. Uh, so that the progressive shortage of resources capable of guaranteeing the water we eat uh, is a very serious issue. For instance, Italy is a quite dangerous country, especially in DOP, DOC, or DOCG production. A bottle of Barolo contains half the water needed to produce a bottle of Bordeaux. The one kilogram stack we put on the table still contains 15,000 liters of water. But most of this meat is imported from Argentina or Poland. So that Italy is one of the greatest net importance of virtual water in spite of its excellent water quality for food production. In this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, illustration, uh, you can see what are the net exporters and the net importers of water. For instance, United States, uh, Canada, Argentina, Australia are net exporters because they uh, export not high quality food but mass food a lot of wheat a lot of uh, f uh, these kind of things a lot of beef and so on why there are many countries where that are net importers and these are some figures of what is uh, uh, the figures of exportation and importation. Mm -hmm. And you can see that we have uh, <coughs> uh, some uh, countries that are import a lot of, so that it is so like in Italy, we had uh, something like uh, in Italy, precipitation is something like uh, one thousand millimeter per year, and we have an extra associated with the importation of food of something like a hundred millimeter per year. It, the uh, water trade, uh, water trade uh, by food, and also also other merchandise, also iron, for instance. If you use a lot of iron uh, made in China. We use a lot of water because iron requires a lot of water. So this is true for food, but not only for food only, also for energy. For instance, as we will see in next uh, slide. But uh, if you look, uh, uh, this is a very nice paper published some years ago about the water trade and the Roman age in the Roman Empire. So that you can see that uh, there was a strong virtual water imports and exports in tons of grain per year at the time grain and at the time the um, transportation was at an 
95% made uh, across the sea or across the river. There was no roads uh, enough, for instance, to import grain from Spain, which was a strong producer, or from uh, Egypt, which was a strong producer of wheat uh, and, and this kind of uh, goods uh, to Italy, to Rome, to the capital. Now, so that you can see that there was a strong system in, in this way. So, so virtual water trade was a fundamental factor for stability of the Roman Empire across several centuries because they developed an efficient virtual water network trade capable of facing internal climate variability over a large geographic area. Because from one year to another one, you can have a drought in Spain, but not a drought in Egypt. You can have a, a, a flood in Italy, but not in Spain, and so on. So that uh, these ex uh, extremes of climate can be a little bit, uh, what we call, uh, equalized by this uh, system of trade. Also, advanced irrigation methods and the efficient virtual water trade network were key factors for the resilience of the human empire, because the Roman Empire survived many, many centuries. Conversely, virtual water trade has a feedback effect, because it increased urbanization towards approaching sustainable levels of growth in terms of water availability. I remember Arezzo was the third, the third uh, largest city in the Roman Empire for a long period, but they entered a, a strong crisis also for uh, the lack of water. And uh, uh, also from the uh, pollution problem. This increased water trade costs, so diminishing long term climate resilience. So that what are uh, the emerging issues in, uh, in our century? Uh, and you can see that the Roman Empire expired also for this reason, was not able in some way to equilibrate, to make an equilibrium in his system. We need in, the, in this century, uh, uh, in the 12th, uh, in the 23rd century, uh, the, the humankind need to increase food production for two reasons. One is population increase. The second one is the fight of malnutrition because there are quite uh, 1 billion people that uh, suffer from malnutrition in the, in this time there is also a need of direct access to food in those countries that export food so that for instance take argentina argentina export a lot amount of food especially beef and uh, cattle and so on but if they increase the population of argentina they have to save for themselves so increasing the need for production in that important country so that if we cannot import so much from another country so that we should achieve a, to reduce to reduce a little bit the food trade the water trade through food all around the world and the solution uh, are of three types the first solution is increase uh, <coughs> the substantially the crop yield because of better irrigation system. If you look at this free system on the right of the slide, we have adequation, we have sprinkling, and we have drip uh, irrigation. There is an order of size of water consumption in the free system, 100, 10, 1. And uh, Italy, for instance, especially the north of Italy, has a lot to do in this. And also, when you, uh, in, uh, 
in your design, our designing system with, uh, uh, with vegetation and so on, you have to take into account that uh, the, the irrigation is a fundamental problem. And you have to move to this system and not to the first system. But uh, how to do, how to afford the problem of uh, increasing food production? One is to transform farmed forests into cultivated areas, into cultivatable areas. But as you see in these two slides that are a symbolic value is that if I, if I transform so much forest, I have some problems with pollution, with climate change, with CO2, with global warming and so on. So that it is only a partial solution for food, but it's a, a bad solution for other uh, issues like climate. The third one is large scale land reclamation for agricultural use. And it is the solution that now has been uh, started by rich countries towards poor countries. We call this also land grabbing, so that uh, uh, many multinational companies and so on have buying land in uh, uh, places in low development countries in order to uh, improve uh, uh, production. The problem is that is that with this type of approach we have a loss of diversity which is enormous because uh, these multinational companies are implanting single single type of, of food production and some single type of crops and if you don't have enough diversity you will have an increase of uh, poverty in the, the developing countries and so that uh, the effect of this increase of poverty will be migration towards large uh, African city, for instance, or large Latin American cities, or large Asian cities, but also migration uh, to these countries, which is a phenomenon that we are very well known now. But there is another issue in competition for water, the second is the competition for energy production because water is fundamental also for energy production. Uh, there is a, also a problem of biofuel supply, but uh, we don't have enough time to approach this because uh, it is uh, 20 minutes to my finish, to my stop of lecture. So that. Uh, as said by Leonardo da Vinci, water is the driving force of nature so that energy from water and water demand for energy production. Because we can have a very good amount of energy developing uh, water systems, water energy system, hydroelectrical plant, which is a non-consumptive use so that you don't waste uh, one liter of water. But we need also, uh, we have a wa strong water demand for energy production with our, um, with our means, especially for size system. So that water needed to produce fuel, food competes on all time and space case with that needed to produce energy. The link between water, food and energy is a keystone of our 23rd century economic and social policy. Without planning of these two macro factors under a joint perspective, Earth is expected to host conflicts of all kinds from those between nations and between different regions of a nation to the struggles within the various society and multiple stakeholders. And you have to understand that still now, still year 
2021, these two areas are completely planned in a different way. So that they are independent. They don't think, because people think the water is uh, an infinite availability. This is hydro energy, as shown just before by Stefano, and you have some idea of how, what, what is the role of hydropower, because hydropower has also the role not only to be renewable, but to be easily controlled so that you can have uh, energy by, by day and stop uh, production by night while with other type of wind, uh, geothermal, other renewables, uh, and also fossil, you cannot uh, achieve a good control, a fine resolution time control like uh, with hydro energy. I put uh, some example here, you can see that uh, uh, this is the first plan in the Fox River, but the second and the largest plan at the time was built in Padano Dugnano. I hope that uh, you will have the capability of visiting Padano Dugnano and the location, which is not far from that of a Leonardo da Vinci ferry boat. And uh, so that you can see that, for instance, uh, cars uh, were electric driving uh, with the Dora Società Industriale Italiana. It was in Genoa, via Carlo Felice, in, uh, with, and uh, the, fabric, the factory was in Alpignano, Torino, and they made fabrica di accumulatori di automobili elettrici. Massima eleganza, silenziose, veloci, no? elegante, quite fast. The ideal, ideal car for city and for Dame, what is Dame is in English, maybe ladies from the ladies. Okay. It had the freno elettrico, so that what you see now with this. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, and you see that the efficiency of an electrical plant is 95%, uh, coal, something like this, it is 35, 40%. So that the, the efficiency is different. <coughs> but water is not only used for uh, hydropower. Water is essential for the thermoelectric industry, traditional or nuclear, especially nuclear, they had a need, an enormous need of water, demand of water. And for the extraction of fossil fuels, from traditional oil and natural gas wells to modern fracking techniques for the extraction of shale gas. Even the production of a solar panel requires a little water, even if a consumption of just under 100 liters is estimated for each megawatt hour produced. <coughs> so that not all industrial um, energy produced with uh, traditional and uh, also modern system like solar panel have the same amount of water. But if you have a, a nuclear, and this is the case in, uh, in the world, you have 450 uh, nuclear power plants, more or less, and all of these plants are close to rivers, in some case to the sea like Fukushima. Uh, growing energy implies growing water consumption. We had more or less, this was a prediction of 10 years ago, but we have more or less 2% annual growth in electricity. And this has been, <coughs> we had a, a stop only during pandemic, during 2020, uh, a little bit, but uh, our last, this is uh, uh, an enormous growth. With the staggering growth production, the ability to produce affordable, sustainable energy becomes more essential than even to secure economic stability and growth. Because you know that energy and food are also a strong effect on the economy and on politics. And since the most major sources of energy require a large amounts of water, this means that the existing water sources will be put on 
and the strain beyond the effort of increasing population and growing agricultural demands. So that we have an increase of domestic water, we have increase of agricultural water, and we have an increase of water for energy. So that growing energy implies growing water consumption. But not only for direct production, but also for instance for hydraulic fracturing, which is a strong uh, for instance, thirty percent of shale gas fields worldwide is located in areas where water supply faces water stress or scarcity. And among these sources, forty percent of the major resources is facing severe freshwater constraint. Typically in the in the Wyoming Plains and these areas, you have this effect, let alone the pollution that can be uh, produced by fracking. So that water scarcity has a strong implication for energy generation. So that energy security is strongly associated with water availability. To date, the energy, water, infrastructure, and policy decision had been made independently of one another, often outdated of sanction regarding rise in demand and resource scarcity. No, because a lot of time they use very old water availability data. It is unbelievable what's... Uh, and energy policy will have to consider that power plants will face some form of water scarcity. The life cycle of power plant is estimating of oh, 30 years, 20 to 40 years. So any electric generation facility being planned or under construction in the region where face problems with water availability, we have to face water scarcity and take it into account in the equation. Today, the use of additional energy extracts more water and speeds the depletion rate of groundwater and rivers. The geological system of local ecosystems struggle to compensate and adapt. In regions, especially with aquifers, and I said, I said before, aquifers are the major source, the major stable source of water availability for man. In regions affected by water scarcity, electricity generators compete for water against other uses, like drinking water or agricultural irrigation. When it, this occurs, case studies show that the water used for human consumption and agriculture is given priority over energy generation. This means that in some extreme cases, power plants have to lower their output and incur high financial losses. I made some example of lack of planning with the year 2006, but also with the drought of years 1977, Europe and Italy in the Po Valley, we had energy loss from both hydroelectric plants because there is a drought and so that they have they have to sustain downstream river drought and so that they couldn't uh, they have to cut the production uh, of hydroelectricity they, they have a lack of cooling water power supply the water supply so that thermoelectric plant has to stop it in many cases nuclear plants in france and germany faced strong risks and this is one of the reason also not only fukushima for that for instance in germany decided to leave uh, nuclear uh, energy in the uh, next uh, 15 years but uh, in night in 2011 texas experienced the worst single year drought in its history the drought of running cotton crops and forced riches to sell cattle that would have been otherwise died. This drought also affected regional energy sources, raising concern about grid operators. It became apparent that there would not be enough water for all usual demands. 
take into account that Texas also faces hurricanes, floods. The Houston flood uh, was uh, doing Harvey was a tragedy, and so on. Brazil drought on the 1314, so that's seven years ago. Uh, Brazil so has very large hydroelectrical plants. The Pavana one is the most important, but there are also other ones. It's the second large hydro energy producer in the world. So that uh, they had a dramatic energy price increase that pushed it toward with energy uh, exploitation of the wind energy. California droughts. You have to know that California droughts are uh, constant in our uh, history of the last 50 years. Hydropower dams in California have a capacity of generating more or less 14,000 megawatts. And uh, in a dry year, uh, you can understand they could not generate unless you kill all the almonds production. So that we had this uh, strong, uh, 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 California is the largest producer of nuts in the world. And so that you had this strong conflict between uh, energy production and agricultural production, which is agriculture is a rich agriculture because they produce nuts for all around the world. India is another example of a trade-off that came from with water shortage. Farmers have desperately attempted to draw crops from the land despite the lack of water, using enormous amounts of energy to pump water from deep underground. Some estimates suggest that energy using in certain drought stricken areas has increased by 55% in last 10 years. This energy used to collect water comes from electricity generated heating stations that use even one more water to satisfy this demand. So producing a dramatic positive feedback effect with dramatic consequences. For instance, the number of suicides by agricultural people in the last years. What are the solutions? Solution may be decouple the growth of energy demand from water, revise the current water and energy policies, emphasize the economic value of water, and focusing of innovation. I had a, a chapter of water in the city, but uh, I think that many others will talk about uh, this subject so that we I have no time, enough time to go on with this. Uh, I also mention uh, the example, if you have time, of day zero in uh, Cape Town of uh, uh, 2018, 2018, because it was a very, very strong <laughs> Uh, example of what can uh, what can happen in a city in a large rich city under a severe drop period. Uh, I made an example of a Istanbul aqueduct, which is the famous cisterna in uh, the famous aqueduct tank. We serve uh, um, the Ottoman uh, aqueduct and so on. And uh, you have to understand that. Istanbul has an increase of population uh, from more or less uh, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century of less than 1 million inhabitants, now it has 4 million, 14 million. So that they have to build a aqueduct from Asia to Europe. I made this example. Okay. Uh, I come to the conclusion because we are here. I think that uh, the man in the world that has a, a, a clear understanding of the water project is Pope Francis uh, with his encyclical letter Laudato Si. And I suggest you to read this because it's a very fundamental document. So that I go to this conclusion that the water, food, energy nexus will dictate the agenda of humankind throughout the century. 
Coping with his nexus is one of the hardest challenges of the earth, jointly with global warming, whose climate effect will in turn entangle an effort to unravel this nexus. All this, while the production and consumption of water energy contribute to more than 70% of the protopogenic gas emission, so that we have also this feedback effect let alone that arising from cattle breeding and another food production activity. Uh, I finish with the, uh, a very famous theory, which is the diamond water paradox. The theory of value supplies an answer to the so-called diamond water paradox with economist Adam Smith uh, pondered was enabled to solve. Adam Smith is a father of capitalism, more or less, in the 18th century. Smith notes that even though life cannot exist without water, it can exist easily without diamonds. Diamonds are, pound for pound, vastly more valuable than water. We had various theory trying to uh, one uh, to understand this, one is a marginal utility theory, another is the labor theory of value by Karl Marx, another is the concept of opportunity cause by Friedrich von Weizen. But a complex economy cannot be rationally played because two market prices are absent. As a result, the information critical for centralized planning cannot be obtained. So that this is still, in my opinion, an open problem. So that's how we conclude that water poverty especially affects Africa while our sector of population have no access to safe drinking water or experience droughts which impede agricultural production. Some countries have areas rich in water with lower endure drastic scarcity. One particularly serious problem in the quality of water is the that the quality of water available for the poor is poor. Every day, unsafe water results in many deaths and the spread of water-related diseases, including those caused by microorganisms and chemical substances. Even as the quality of availability of water is constantly diminishing, in some places there is a growing tendency, despite its scarcity, to privatize these resources turning into a commodity subject to the laws of the market. Yet, access to safe drinkable water is a basic and universal human right, since it is essential to human survival and, as such, is a condition for the exercise of other human rights. Greater scarcity of water will lead to an increase in the cost of food and the various products which depend on its use. Some studies warn that an acute water shortage may occur within a few decades unless urgent action is taken. The environmental repercussion could affect billions of people. It is also conceivable that the control of water by large multinational businesses may become a major source of conflict in this center. We are all architects of the future. Most of you are architects also in the present. And the international community, though this decision in efforts, is already investing in the tomorrow of our planet. It's necessary to develop a financial plan as well as wide ranging water projects. This result will lead to overcoming the notion of turning water into a mere commodity regulated exclusively by market laws. <laughs> Environment and energy are the two corners of a resilience plan after the pandemic, according to European Union policy. It is desirable that the break between water management and energy management is recomposed at least at the continental level. And this is very important, especially in some countries like Spain and, uh, and Italy, and Spain, uh, Italy and uh, France. Water, food, and energy must be directed with wisdom and knowledge in all planning and management stresses. 
and above all, it is necessary to carefully evaluate the number of soft feedback effects that any action the energy, agricultural, cattle breeding, food, and water areas is able to trigger. So that energy, agriculture, cattle breeding, food uh, system, and water areas should be assessed taking into account of all the feedback acts of, of feedback effort of any action. This is our my last book. Uh, you can see this is my you can deliver this slide so that uh, you can find. And so that I thank your attention, uh, hoping that uh, the Navigli system in Milan will be finally become a real and not a virtual issue in this country.